Turn this morning to uh, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and we have been talking about seven things in these uh, verses here when we come unto Mount Zion. And we need to remember that Mount Zion was the Mount of Grace. Mount Sinai was the uh, place really of death. And you could not touch it, you could not ascend near it. But here at Mount Zion, Mount Zion, we have the grace to come before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to serve Him with boldness and also with gladness. So we looked the last couple of weeks of uh, coming unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all men, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And we talked about that last week, about our righteousness and our righteousness in him. But notice in verse 24, he says, and now we come to Jesus, to the mediator of the new covenant. As you read through your scripture, even in the Old Testament, you will find that the promises only come through Jesus Christ to us. He is the source of those promises. And he is the one who dispenses those promises of all which we uh, hope for. He is in us and we are in him. Again, John chapter 14 and verse 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, For there is no other name given among men under heaven, whereby you must be saved. And in John chapter 5 and verses 39 and 40, when speaking to the uh, crowd that was gathered around there, Jesus said unto them, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, but you will not come unto me that you might have life. Remember Jesus said that uh, not only is he the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the door. By me if any man enter in, he shall go in and out and shall be saved. Jesus said in John chapter 8 that I am the light of the world. He said that he was the bread of life. He said that he was a good shepherd. In John chapter 11, when Martha or Mary, one of the sisters, I can't ever remember which one, came out and said unto him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? Amen. Well, do you? Because if you don't, you haven't come to Jesus. And we come to Jesus by recognizing that we're sinners. That our sin has separated us from God. And no amount of good works will ever let any one of us even darken the door of heaven. Why? The writers say, for all our righteousness are as filthy rags. There is nothing good in us. You ever stop and think about, uh, we were talking, uh, talking with Larry the other day, and we were talking about uh, eternal life, and how there are some today who say that you can lose your salvation. Well, let me tell you something. If you could, you would. That's all it is to it. If I could, I would. That's our nature. But salvation doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with what God has already done through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the real question is, either He can keep us, or He can't. And He can. Especially if you read the book of Hebrews, who by one offering, one offering, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was continual offering after offering after offering 
that could never appease the, uh, uh, the satisfaction of God. And you also remember that uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 1, in verse 21, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's why Christ came. That I came not to be served, but I came to minister and to be a servant unto many. And you know what? Many times as believers, we forget that. We forget that we're servants also. And that our responsibility here is to serve others. And yet, sometimes that's just too much for some of us, isn't it, huh? You do something, people gripe and people complain. Well, you don't think they did the same with the Lord? And they'll keep doing that. Listen to J. Vernon McGee the other day. And old J. Vernon said that of the meanest people that he's ever met, the meanest people that he's ever met, and he's talking about those, those who were prison, uh, those who have been in prison, those who got out of prison, those who beat people up, he said the meanest people he ever met were Christian in a church because of the way they acted sometimes. And you know what? He's right. He's absolutely right. Some of the meanest people around are people who call themselves believers. Jesus never acted that way. Now, I need to ask you a question this morning. Do you know for sure that your sins have been forgiven and that you are justified in him? Remember when, when the Greeks came and, and the disciples said, what do you want? And they said, sirs, we would see Jesus. Well, you know, that's what we need to see. We need to see Jesus. I ran across a real, really uh, neat illustration that uh, someone gave me this little book for a, uh, a gift. And it's called First Desire. John Jasper was a former slave and following the Civil War, pastored the 6th Mount Zion Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. And this was a great church. He was preaching one Sunday morning about heaven and the joys which will await us on the other side. His vivid, his, his avid uh, imagination and emotions were caught up. And as he opened his mouth to speak, he couldn't say a word. He tried several times <clears throat> and the great congregation sat in anticipation. He tried again, but no sound. He was overcome with emotion. Then the tears began to roll down his black cheeks. Still, he would attempt to, to articulate, but no sound would come out. Finally, he just shook his head and waved the crowd to the doors, but they continued to sit still. Then he walked to the side of the pulpit, and with his hand on the door to his study, and again waved the crowd toward home, no one moved. Then he moved to the pulpit and with great effort composed himself and leaned over it and said something like this. Brothers and sisters, when I think of the glory which shall be revealed in us, I can visualize that day when old John Jasper's last battle has been fought and the last burden had been borne. I can visualize that day when this tired servant of God shall lay down his burdens and walk up the battlements of the city of God. I can almost hear the mighty angel on guard say, John Jasper, you want your shoes? And I was going to say, of course I want my shoes, my golden slippers to walk the gold paved streets of the city of God, but not now. Then I can hear the mighty angel as he says, John Jasper, don't you want your robe? And I was going to say, of course I want my robe, that robe of linen clean and white which am the righteousness of the saints, but not now. Then the angel would say, John Jasper, you want your crown? And I say, of course, mighty angel. I want all the rewards that's coming to me. 
this poor black servant of the lamb, but not now. Then the angel would say, John Jasper, wouldn't you like to see Elijah, John the Beloved, and Paul? And I'll say, of course, mighty angel. I want to know and to shake hands, and yes, I have loved ones over here, but not now. First, I want to see Master Jesus. I want to see him first of all. And you know what? That should really be the desire of our hearts also. We would see Jesus. Well, let me ask you a question. When you think of seeing Jesus, what do you think about? You ever think about it? Huh? You ever think about seeing Jesus? What do you think about him? Huh? When, you think, when you think those thoughts. You think he's the Savior? Of course he's the Savior. Is he the Son of God? Of course he's the Son of God. Is he the virgin-born one? Of course he's the virgin-born one. Is he the one that promised us eternal security? Of course he's the one that promised us eternal security. But let's look at it in a practical manner. Now what are some of the practical things that we see when we see Jesus? Beg your pardon? All right, serving him in heaven. Well, notice, first of all, he says here that he is the uh, mediator of the new covenant. And in Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 6, uh, that, passage of, that passage of Scripture reads, But now hath he obtained a more excellent mercy, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And so, all the things in the Old Testament had to be repeated over and over and over again. Jesus completed it in one sacrifice, through his blood. Not only is he the mediator of a new covenant, when you think about Jesus, do you see his holiness? Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, he says, Be ye holy as I am holy. And so when we come to Jesus Christ, we see first of all his righteousness or, or his holiness. Do you, do you see his righteousness? Hebrews chapter 1 in verse 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He loves righteousness. He hates iniquity. And how about sometimes we who name him as Savior... And he looks at us, can he see that holiness that we're striving for? Can he see that righteousness that we are to display in our lives? Or does he see iniquity in us? Does he see pride in us? Does he see bitterness or hatred or criticism in us? These are two of the things that he should see we are striving for in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he hath made him sin, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. So do you see his holiness? Do you see his righteousness? Do you see his goodness? Matthew chapter 19, when the rich young man came to Jesus. And what did he say to him? Good master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Are we trying to do those things that are good? Are we trying to do those things that are right? If Paul said, be ye imitators of me, he only said that because he was an imitator of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be imitators of him also. In Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, it says what? Think of those things which are pure those things which are just, those things which are right, those things which are holy and honest. 
Is that what we're thinking about? Do we think about those things? Are they constantly on our minds? We can't always say that, can we? Huh? You ever get down to pray honestly and your mind begins to wander? You really have something you want to bring before God and the next thing you know you're thinking about your vacation you're going to take six months from now. And what you're going to do and what you're going to eat and everything like that. It's not easy, is it? Huh? It's not easy to practice holiness. It's not easy to practice righteousness. It's not easy to practice goodness. We live in a corrupt world. You know, I was, I was, I was talking to someone who was, who, who was, who was uh, talking about the drug problem in Amherst. You can buy heroin very, very cheap. And let me tell you something. From what I've read and the people I know, once you're hooked on heroin, you're hooked. Okay? All right? And young women will do anything to get their heroin. If that means selling their bodies, if that means degrading themselves, they will do anything to satisfy that lust. Does that make you sick when you think about those things? I was telling Edith the other night, if I was 30 years younger, I would get me a half dozen ex-Marines, and I would find out, go down there and find out who those drug dealers are, and we would beat the living stew out of every one of them. You say, is, is that wrong? Huh? Is that wrong? I don't think so. You can argue with me if you want to about that. All right? You yeah, had justice in your own hands and everything else. But what would you do if your kid or your daughter got hooked on some of those things? We, we, we... <laughs> I was just, I was using, the, I was using the illustration there, okay? All right, I was using the illustration. Now, where was I? But you, you, you cannot deny that there's evil in this world. And Satan wants to corrupt. And he'll do it in any way that he can. And you know what? The thing about Satan is, Satan will always give you the best first. Okay? He'll always give you the best first. Stop and think about that, okay? And then he has nothing to give you but the worst that comes from the consequences and the result of the best that he can give you, which is nothing but evil, which is nothing but wrong, which is nothing but lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. God saved the best for last. We come to Jesus. Have you come to Jesus? You know for sure that you have trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your heart. Do you see his faithfulness? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. Faithful is he who calleth you who will also do it. Do you see his glory? In John chapter 1 and verse 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We, we can go on and on and on and talk about His, his guilelessness. In Him there was no sin and no guile. We can, we can talk about His sinlessness, His spotlessness, spotlessness, his innocence, his resisting temptation, uh, his harmlessness. We can, we can talk about his obedience to God, his subjection to his parents while he was growing up, his meekness, his lowliness in heart, his mercifulness, his patience, his long-suffering, his compassion, his benevolence, his loving, his self-denying, he's forgiving. All those things characterize seeing Jesus. Or coming to Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, 
But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those are things we are to strive for in our lives. Those are the things that we are to be uh, 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 putting into what God wants us to be. You know, he's forgiven us, we're justified in him, and we can only have real peace in our lives when we trust Jesus Christ by faith. He also says in, uh, we've come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So we come to the sprinkled blood and to come to Christianity is to come to Jesus Christ and to the sprinkled blood. It is the atoning blood through which, through only which, we have redemption of sins. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins through the grace of, or through the riches of his grace. And... In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are brought near by the blood of Christ. Remember uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 where it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it, he being dead, yet speaks. Now, what he's simply saying there is that when he brought a gift, he brought his gift by faith. It was, it was, it was something that God had given him. It was the lamb. He brought the lamb. Cain brought his own works of his hands. And that's what many people do today. They believe that by doing their good works, they're going to get into heaven. That their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds. You ever hear somebody say, well, I'm a good person? No, you're not. You're not good, I'm not good. Apart from Christ, we're, we don't have anything. Apart from Christ, we want to do our own thing. It's what uh, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, in the first four or five verses say. When we, when we, when we uh, were without Christ, we did what? We did what we wanted to. We talked like we wanted to talk. We went where we wanted to wear. Well, went where we wanted to go. We did what we wanted to do. That was normal. We didn't think anything, anything wrong about that. I remember when I first, uh, when I first got married, and uh, I was in, uh, I was in the service, and uh, in the service. We use cuss words just like we talk everywhere else. And I went home one time and I was cussing up a storm at the table and this little white old lady went across and slapped me upside my head. I said, what? <laughs> to me, it was just second nature. Uh, and and uh, uh, I didn't do it again at the table, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, but those things were all second nature unto us. And, and you know, we, we, we really don't care. We don't care who we take advantage of. Oh, now, that's not saying that there's, there's not some moral uh, uh, equivalent in us. Uh, there, there is to some degree. But I'll tell you what, when you're unsaved, if, that, if, if the moral uh, degree in you comes to the point where... Uh, you're going to get stuck or someone else is going to get stuck. Let me tell you who's going to get stuck, okay? The other person, all right? And that part of the moral equivalency will be, will be put. That's, uh, that just, that's, that's the natural man. The natural man understands not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They don't care. They, they don't care about spiritual thing. Hey, man, if you want to go to church, you go ahead and go to church. I'm not going. You know, I ain't going to sit with those bunch of hypocrites and when you go to work with them, you know, you go to the ball game with them, 
You go down to the bar and drink with them. So, you know, get off of that kick there, Jack. Uh, there's hypocrites no matter where you go. Now tell me something. Have you ever been a hypocrite? Doggone right you have. In some way, in some manner, all of us have. But you know what? When you come to Christ, those things are gone. Those things are done. Jesus has washed them away and will never remember them again. They will never be held against us. Never be held against us. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. So only He, only in Christ, can we find the peace that we're looking for. Only in Christ, by faith. And that's why, that's why Abel's gift was acceptable, because it was offered in faith. It had no atoning power whatsoever, not even for Abel. But the Scripture teaches that Jesus' blood was sufficient to cleanse all our sins for all times and allows us in Christ to make peace with God for whoever trusts in that blood sacrifice. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven. And you know, the, 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 the fire in Israel's blood sacrifices always cried out for more. But Christ's blood quenched the fire and it satisfied God forever. Read Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, it, 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 gives a, it gives a perfect picture of how Jesus Christ sacrifice and atonement met the requirements that God specified for mankind to be reconciled to God. And so when we come to Mount Zion, we come to the city of the living God. How many of the prophets and writers said that uh, uh, I, I, uh, I trust the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a living God. He's not a dead God. Okay? He's not some idol that is put out in the yard with a roof over his head. Oh, no, no, no. We have a living God. Number two, the heavenly Jerusalem. And one day, he's going to bring that heavenly Jerusalem down to this earth. And we're going to be part of that as we serve him. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. If you're here today in Christ, you're part of that general assembly and firstborn and your name is written in heaven. And to the spirits or to, the, to, the, to God, the judge of all. You know, we, we, we talk about this and, and uh, you know, mankind thinks that he can... Uh, do what he wants to do when he wants to do it and that one day he'll reason with God and God will understand. It's like, it's like the song, uh, who is it, the Doobie Brothers or the Almond Brothers, Lord, I was born a rambling man trying to make a living and doing the best I can and when it's time to leave here, I hope you understand that I was born a rambling man. Hey, you know, that's not going to cut it. Not going to cut it at all. And we come to Jesus. Now, I don't know how to make that much more clear. So if you're here today and have never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I, 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 I urge you, I beg you to consider Christ and to invite him into your heart to forgive you of your sin. That you'll be part of that general assembly and the firstborn whose name is written in heaven. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this portion of Scripture and 
the reality that it brings to realize that, man, these are promises that you've given to us. These are truths that we need to continually apply in our hearts. And Lord, uh, we know that for many, it's far too easy to quit than to struggle through. That sometimes it just seems that God isn't listening, God isn't there, God doesn't care, uh, God's too busy with someone else. But that's, you know, that's not true. Uh, as we exercise our faith, as we exercise uh, what, to try and put these principles into our hearts and into our lives, then uh, God begins to do the things that he longs to do to conform us to the image of his son. And he will do that. Father, help us not to struggle against those things. Help us to realize the process that we go through. We need what you, what you want to do in our hearts and lives. Whether it's pleasant or whether it's not pleasant. For your praise and for your glory. Lord, don't let anyone leave today not knowing that Jesus Christ is not Lord and Savior of their lives. We trust the Holy Spirit of God to minister and to deal with them. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, look around and see who's, uh, who's not here and drop them a line or a card or a visit this week, all right? <laughs>